it's it's very slight and so a lot of this engagement will remain on the platform and user time is over 30 minutes which for many of the socials is really a success story because many are still kind of under that 30 minute threshold Hey gang, it's Tuesday, May 18th. Oscar, Peter and listeners, welcome to the Behind the Numbers Daily, the marketer podcast made possible by Vtex. I'm Marcus. Today I'm joined by two folks. We have with us uh, one of our directors of forecasting, it's Oscar Orozco. Hi Marcus, happy to be on. Hey buddy, thanks for joining us. We're also joined by senior forecasting analyst Peter Newman. Hey Marcus, great to see you again. Hey Peter, yeah, you too friend. So today's fact... The country with the widest stretch of land, Russia, spans 11 different time zones. So Russia is the only place in the world where one citizen could be waking up at 8 a.m. and the other could be going to bed <laughs> at 11 p.m., <laughs> which is madness. Incredible. Other uh, Russia facts. The first edition of Tetris was invented by a Russian, 1984, Russian programmer and scientist Alexei Pesitnov. So thank you for that. And then also Russia covers around 17% of the world's inhabited land. Russia is home to only 2% of uh, Earth's inhabitants. So there's lots of space going on. Russia is 60% forest. What's more interesting is that half of that forest is totally uninhabited by humans, which sounds really nice. So forget the show. I'm off to Russia. (laughs) No one else wants to come? Uh, good. Tiger. That's the point. Yeah. I'm going by myself. So, sounds sounds, sounds a little me. bit like Alaska. Maybe I'll just start there. <laughs> That's what I'm <laughs> looking for. <laughs> <laughs> Today's real topic, social media use in 2021. So we are talking about Social media today, as Q1 earnings season draws to a close, we wanted to see how the social networks look now that the dust has settled, who's growing the fastest, which platforms are struggling to find new users and why. So we're going to run through the major social networks and talk about the most interesting user trends that we see now that Peter has completed our new social networking numbers. Uh, so we'll start with, we have to start with Facebook. What the hell would we be doing if we didn't start with Facebook? So Peter... You note that Facebook users will increase to 180 million, 180, in 2021 in the US. Less than 1% growth on 2020 to mark our lowest growth for the platform so far. What's contributing to this low user growth for Facebook this year? Well, there's a couple of big things going on. So a lot of people who would have started using Facebook for the first time this year already did last year. They just jumped on in 2020 and signed up for an account. Even if they were reticent, they didn't necessarily trust, want to be on there. They found they really needed to in the year of 2020 that we all endured. So it pulled forward some of that growth. It was going to be probably 2021, but it pulled it into 2020. Exactly. But then the other big thing that's dragging down on Facebook is they're not really gaining share among the youngest of users. The number of people 12 to 17 who are using Facebook is dropping every year. We just have fewer and fewer preteens and teens who are signing up for Facebook at all. Mm -hmm. And they were also seeing falls among 18 to 24 year olds. So Facebook is not bringing in new users. It's not bringing in young users. It's growing some among older populations, among those especially 65 plus but it's not bringing in the newest of internet users. So we're going to have a whole generation of Facebook nevers coming up. Huh. And and this is what you mean by Facebook. You say in your write-up, Facebook is facing an uncertain future. This is what you mean. Exactly. Yeah. Facebook is, we're just seeing kids, teenagers who are just never using, never going to be on the blue app. They're just Mm. never going to be on Facebook. And Facebook, while Instagram is its bright spot and will be sort of where it gets engagement with those users, it's not doing so on sort of the core revenue generator, the core property. Yeah. So let's go through some of those numbers because you're, you're spot on. The share of college age kids, use, well, let's go up. The, the share of younger teens, internet users who use platform going from 40% of younger teens, 17 down, from 40 to 35%. Uh, it was 2019 to 2023. For college age kids over that same time span, goes from 66% to 61 And then, yeah, it seems like the majority, the kind of stronghold is the 25 to 54-year-olds. They have shares in the 70 to 
percent range in terms of penetration of internet users, depending on the group, and they're pretty stable. And then the older users, they also kind of hit a wall, though, right? I mean, it's kind of creeping up a tiny bit, but the share of older users who use Facebook, and the share of 55 to 64 internet users using Facebook goes from 60 to 63, 2019 to 2020, and then slams on the brakes. Same with 65 plus, that goes from 52 to 55, and then hits the brakes as well. But that totals up to a a tiny, tiny bit of growth. So falling below the 1% mark this year, it was at the 3.3% mark for total Facebook users in the US last year, and then just below 1% this year, as we mentioned, and then continuing to hover around just north or south of that 1% mark, continuing into the future. Oscar, how does time spent on the platform look for Facebook? Same problem? Same problem. Uh, looking at the, we break out six six platforms. Uh, Facebook was the one and, and looking kind of pre-pandemic versus, you know, post-pandemic, I guess we could call it now. Uh, it was the platform mm-hmm. that grew the least. So we had projected, you know, in late 2019 that users were spending around 33 minutes on the platform due to the pandemic up to 34.6 minutes. So that growth is only about 4.9%. So close to 5% growth. Again, the smallest increases due due to the pandemic out of all of the platforms that we analyze. And what happens to that number going forward? It's a dead flat, ticks back down? It ticks back down, ticks back down to close to 4% decline. So almost all of those minutes are lost in 2021. Not not all of them. But I will say Facebook is a platform that has been losing engagement for a number of years since 2017. Mm. So any sort Mm. of, even if it's flat, positive growth is, is good for the platform. Okay. Let's move to Instagram owned by Facebook. Uh, Peter, you just mentioned them. Uh, You explained that the platform's growth has accelerated further from prior estimates. How come? So Instagram last year and then Instagram, especially in 2020, and then further again this year is just the platform of choice for so many people. Oscar can probably attest to this with time spent numbers, but Mm -hmm. it's drawing the Internet native generations especially are just Instagram is their platform. It's the one that they use. It's the one that they relate to most, that they sort of use the most to consume and to share. And as people were seeking out ways to share experiences, especially through lockdowns last year and this, Instagram is much more amenable to that than Facebook. Instagram is uh, you're able to just see pictures, see video. And then especially with the introduction of stories and then especially reels late last year, it's letting people get the sort of short form video that has just exploded in popularity. It's giving Instagram users access to that sort of video even more so than in the past. Mm-hmm. And how does that growth look for Instagram? Do, are we seeing, do we see a similar pandemic bump and then it coming back down? How, what's the story there? So the growth for Instagram jumped up last year. It was higher in 2020 than we had been looking beforehand. We increased Instagram's growth both last year and then again a little bit more this year because just the surveys that we're getting just can't keep up with reality. People are just continue to jump on Instagram and we get a slightly late capture, but we are trying to adjust for it. And Instagram's growth, it grew 6.2% last year. It's growing another 3.7% this year. And we're expecting another 3.5% growth next year. And then by 2025, we're looking at 133 million Instagram users in the US. Okay. And that 2020 growth, that 6.2 is is quite similar to the year before, right? 7.1 the year before that, 10% the year before that. So not a radical jump, but still healthy single digits nonetheless. Let's move on to Twitter here. Uh, Peter, you talk about Twitter's renaissance amid the news heavy pandemic and uh, 2020's political drama. And then you go on to explain that this mini renaissance will continue into 2021. How is Twitter able to do that? Well, Twitter's doing a couple of really interesting things in ways that our numbers actually don't totally capture. It's giving people outlets for the fast developing ways of consuming news, especially. It's recently rolled out Twitter spaces to basically capture what Clubhouse is trying to do and giving Mm -hmm. a multitude more users on all sorts of platforms the ability to participate in audio chat rooms. It's also adding subscription features that are going to make it more attractive for creators to be on the platform and potentially brands as well, and also allow the company itself to better weather a drop in subscribers with additional streams of revenue beyond just the advertising that's, and promotion that's there now. Mm-hmm. But news 
also has just not tailed off in 2021 like we necessarily thought it would. The world mm-hmm. is still coming fast and thick, and it's keeping its highly engaged audience on the platform, which we right. thought would probably be dropping off, but we found just is not. A quick note too, Marcus, with Twitter, kind of a bit under the radar has been the success of topics and they keep adding more topics. So these are topics that people can follow. There's more than 6,000 at the moment. It increases personalization. There's notifications for the users. And that really has also been super successful for the platform starting you know, in 2020. And, and I, I think it'll be the case for the coming years. Mm-hmm. So is it something around the, in the realm of 55 million last year, 56 million this year is somewhere around there? And then kind of hovering around 55 million going forward? That's right. It's peaking this okay. year at 55.6 million. So it's just a tiny increase on last year. Just we're looking at about 125,000 new monthly users this year. Right. Okay. Before dropping down. Okay. So yeah, it's definitely a, short, a short-lived renaissance. The real one, the European flavor of cultural, artistic, economic rebirth lasted from the 14th century to the 17th. This one's going to last about seven months but it definitely isn't a mini renaissance of sorts for sure yeah it's only going to last that long because next year user growth is going to dip ever so slightly into the red we expect uh, twitter to lose three hundred thousand folks in 2022 in the u.s oscar uh, how about uh, time spent on the platform we're we seeing similar levels of engagement Yeah, very similar trend there. Coming from 2019, we projected that users spent about 26 minutes a day on the platform. That grew an incredible 25% in 2020. Yeah, only uh, we only saw larger growth from TikTok. We'll get to that later. Mm -hmm. Uh, But up to uh, over 32 minutes, there will be a decline of close to 7% in 2021. But I mean, it's very slight. And so a lot of this engagement will remain on the platform. And user time is over 30 minutes, which for many of the socials is really a success story because many are still kind of under that 30 minute threshold. So Twitter will maintain that 30 minute threshold moving forward into our forecast years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a special club, that over 30 minute mark. Let's move to Snapchat. Peter, what is Snapchat's story? Pun, very much intended. (laughs) Thank you. So Snapchat's growing too. It's continuing to kind of slow and steady at this point. It's no longer in any sort of explosive growth phase, but we have a rising 2.6% this year, reaching 87.3 million monthly active users. But and the most interesting thing about Snapchat is that it, like Facebook in a way, is aging, though not nearly as extremely. It's aging in, with much younger people. But for the first time next this year, actually, the share of Snapchat users who are over 25 will be greater than the number who are under that age. So more than half of Snapchat's users now are 25 plus, which has never been the case in our numbers before. So Snapchat's hmm. users are just growing. Wow. They're just maturing, growing older, but staying on the platform. Interesting. That's this year for the first time? Yes, the first time this year. Okay. Because it seems like the 35 to 44-year-olds, they've kind of been carrying growth last year and this year, right? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Let's move quickly on to TikTok. We're going to get through a few more here. TikTok witnessed insane growth last year, which is a devastating understatement. Will that continue, Peter, this year with TikTok users? Not quite as extremely. It just absolutely exploded last year with almost 90% growth. This year, it'll be a little more tepid. Most of the people who want to be the platform got there already, but we're still seeing 18.3% growth, which is the highest of any social platform that we are looking at here. So that is nothing to sneeze at. It's Mm going to be on 78.7 million people's phones this year. And we're expecting that to continue to rise through the next five years. By 2025, we're looking at 97 million people in the US using TikTok and in 2023, it actually is set to surpass Snapchat in terms of monthly users. Wow, quite the milestone. TikTok overtaking Snapchat, we project by 2023, somehow is just two years away. You had some interesting notes about by age as well. Mm-hmm. What, what's going on there? So actually, like Snapchat, TikTok is seeing its user base mature, though it's a little different. For Snapchat, it's the user base is aging and it's sort of existing users are just get older and older as sort of you know one person turns 35 they go into a new demographic bucket the way we look at things Mm -hmm. but for tiktok it's just attracting more and more users from 
especially the older groups that want to sort of stay with what the hip kids are doing. You know, they right. want to keep watching out for what's going on. So we're looking at actually just like for Snapchat, TikTok, more than half of its users are going to be 25 plus this year as well. So, you know, the common impression of TikTok is you know, teenagers who are doing all sorts of things in videos, and it's sort of the teen app, but it's actually expanding radically among older groups as well, among 25 and older. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were talking about overtaking Snapchat. TikTok users, you said that they're the younger TikTok users, the Gen Z TikTok users, overtaking Instagram? Yep, that's right. So the number of monthly users of TikTok who are part of Gen Z, it's okay. overtaken Instagram's Gen Z users. There are more Zoomers who are using TikTok now than there are who use Instagram. Now, there's a huge, wow. over, there's a huge overlap between those two, but uh -huh. there are 37 million who are using TikTok and just 33 million who are using Instagram right now. Okay. Oscar, we've got some relatively new TikTok time spent numbers. What's that picture look like? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, TikTok's growth in 2020 was 41% for time spent by users on TikTok. It was growth wow. that we've never, ever seen before, that we've never estimated for any platform. Just really incredible. It's a jump of about 11 and a half minutes from just 2019. And for this year, it's, it's just declining 5%. So just a couple, a, a minute, I would say, uh, more or less. But it speaks to, you know, the video aspect of the platform, which helps it retain a lot of this engagement moving forward. And what's the total time people spend on TikTok this year? So it's uh, it's about 30, close to 37 minutes. So 36.7 oh. minutes. Yeah, wow. And it's higher, uh, we've mentioned it before, higher than Facebook. So it's officially yeah. the most engaging social platform out there. Yeah, that's bananas. Mm -hmm. and also, yeah, in that 30 minute plus club already. Oh, so yeah. soon, TikTok, so soon. Oh, yeah. um, let's move to Reddit finally in the first half of the show. Peter, what's Reddit's story on the user side? What's going on? So Reddit is actually showing growth nearly as strong as TikTok for this year. It's going to reach 43 million Reddit users who are logged in with an account every month. That's a 14% increase building on a very strong 2020 where it saw 26% growth. So it's taking – I mean the platform is basically – people get lured in in a lot of ways with viral content. There was the whole meme stock craze and GameStop exploding all over the place in January that has brought in thousands and hundreds of thousands of new users. And it's also capitalizing on news and discussion and short video and basically having a place that sort of does – a lot of the things that all the other platforms do in one, mm. in a kind mm -hmm. of less refined way. So it's going to reach levels nearly on par with Twitter within the, the next couple of years. Yeah, 43 million, as you said, 43 million uh, Reddit users this year in the US. That's up from 26 three years prior. So from 26 to 43 million, 2018 to 2021. So that's the backstory. You also note the gender split, 68% male, 32% female, but that's, that's changing going forwards. It is. It's it's still going to be there with the nature of Reddit. Uh, it's probably never going to go away entirely, but it's mm -hmm. going from 68-32 male-female back in 2018 to 63-37 this year. So it's oh, okay. getting closer on par. That's about the same level that we see with Pinterest going the other way. So you know, there's always going to be a gender split on Reddit, but it's not quite as extreme, not quite as limiting necessarily as it was in years past. So 6832 was three years ago. Today, it's 6337. That's right. And okay. And that's going to be relatively stable, but still leaning towards more, a few more women on the, on the platform. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Going forwards. All right. That's all we got time for, for the first half of the show. It's time now for the halftime report. Where we summarize the key takeaways from the lead story in 30 seconds before in other news, our second half of the show. As you know, you know what's going on. Uh, let's start with Peter and then we'll move to Oscar. Peter, what are your key takeaways from the first half? The biggest thing to take away is that demographics and age are just driving the way that these platforms users are going to move the future. Facebook, everyone's dealing with an aging user base except TikTok, it seems, even them. But everyone is going to have to cope with the constant changing demographics of their users and find new ways to bring in young users, to bring in new users, to engage with the most active social users. Excellent takeaway. Oscar, it's a tough act to follow, mate. Best of luck. Not at all. Let's, let's, 
<laughs> no, that was great, Peter. But talking <laughs> about uh, time spent, what, what I think is the main takeaway is a lot of this engagement has remained sticky in, in 2021. So these platforms, you know, users are still spending almost as much time as they did in 2020 uh, on these platforms this year. And I think what's going to help with that engagement will be the shift to commerce, social commerce, to video, as we're seeing with Reels, with Spotlight and Snapchat, for example. So if, if they keep up with this, I wouldn't be surprised if all platforms surpass the 30 minute a day number and, and join that club, which is, as we know, is, is so key for these platforms. Oscar comes through in the clutch and drills the three to tie the game. Luca Dontich. Who's not so good? That's what we've got time for for the lead story. It's time now for in other news. First quick word from our sponsor, Vtex. Retail's next competitive threat may come from a business model or channel that didn't even exist a few months ago. This modern dynamic requires companies to adapt quickly, pivoting business seemingly overnight, something traditional commerce platforms just can't support. There's a new enterprise commerce platform on the rise, one that's fast, flexible, and doesn't require nine months and a million dollars to get up and running. Go to vtex, V-T-E-X dot com slash eMarketer to learn more. All right, folks, we are back today in other news. Social media companies trying to make their platforms less anxiety-provoking. The NFL and iHeartMedia just signed a significant podcast deal and the nostalgia marketing trend. Story one, social media companies are trying to make their platforms, quote-unquote, less anxiety-provoking writes Rachel Lerman of the Washington Post. There's a couple of things going on here. I pulled these from a bunch of different places, but a few features that social platforms are introducing to try and make their platforms, their their conversations healthier. So number one is Instagram is letting a handful of users hide like counts on posts. Instead of the number, they would simply see something that said Marcus and others like this. Number two, Instagram is also launching a tool to let users automatically filter out abusive DMs, direct messages from those they do not follow on the platform. Number three, Facebook will start testing a pop-up similar to Twitter that asks users if they're sure they want to share an article that they haven't opened, prompting them to read the article first. However, users can still share the article if they want to without reading it. And uh, number four, Twitter's new feature detects mean replies. The people are getting ready to send and automatically sends a prompt asking them if they want to review this before tweeting. The user is then presented with three choices, tweet, edit, or delete. Um, We'll start with Oscar. Uh, What would you make of these attempts for social media to make the platforms just a a lot nicer, if you will? Yeah, I mean, I I think a few of the ideas were were interesting to me. For example, the ability to filter out like abusive messaging, to deal with bullying. I do think that that would work. What I think ultimately is if you put the feature in the user's hands, in other words, let the user decide what they want to do with the platform themselves, I think that works. That experience ends up being a plus for the user. Now, some of these features where the platform sort of forces something new on the user, thinking of like the Twitter story where, you know, people have to click through stories or or read them for a a select amount of time before sharing them, that ultimately will just frustrate the user. It messes with the user experience. So, So again, I think it comes back to letting the user decide. Okay. Yeah. Mitchell Clark of The Verge points out that this can be annoying on Twitter. He was saying since you may have read the article somewhere else and you just want to share it on that platform. Uh, but Peter, please. No, I mean, I'm not so sure that it's about sharing news. Yeah, that's pro- that one probably it might be just a little annoying, but especially for the, the Twitter mean replies and for Instagram's DMs, it's adding a, a second for people to reconsider what they're doing. So the Instagram features, new feature to be filtering out mean DMs, for instance, is time, it comes just a couple of weeks after in the UK, there was the entire footballing world basically came to a stop to have a pause from social media for an entire mm-hmm. weekend because yeah. of mass racism on social media. So they're trying to give, I think, ways to try to self-regulate before any other government, any governments potentially mm-hmm. step in to deal with the problem of anonymity online, which... Everyone is loath to give up, but if they can just add in a pause step where you say, are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure you want to send 
this footballer on your team a mean message right now, that might be enough to get people to stop doing it and mean that you don't need to have anyone else stepping in. Yeah, pretty significant social media boycott across the pond in the soccer world, as, as Peter noted. And it looks like that works to a certain extent, saying to people, hang on a second, are you sure you want to do this? Jacqueline Diaz of NPR notes that according to Twitter, when prompted, 34% of people revised their initial reply or decided not to send it at all. So a third of people responding to this after they were first prompted, users composed about 11% fewer offensive replies in the future going forward. They also were less likely to receive offensive replies in return as well. This is all according to Twitter. On the like counts thing, hiding like counts, a nightmare for influencers when be able to see uh, how other people's posts are doing, even though they'll get data about their own stuff. Uh, we move to story two. The NFL and iHeartMedia just signed a significant podcast deal the country's most popular sport, will develop some uh, new audio shows with the iHeart Podcast Network, according to Variety, that will air before the league's 2021 season. The NFL already produces seven podcasts. They will now be distributed by iHeart, whose US podcast ad revenues neared $100 million last year, set to grow nearly 100% in 2021 somehow, uh, in large part to uh, this acquisition strategy. Thoughts on the deal, Peter? The deal with, with the interesting thing, they're going to be focusing on content that is sort of evergreen. They're going to be doing historical content and discussions based on archives. So this will be a great tool for the NFL and for iHeart to just keep interest in football going and to capitalize on the ongoing interest of a 12-month-a-year sport, even when there's no games going on to discuss, even when you've talked all that you possibly can about training <laughs> camp, there's still going to be more and more for them to be diving into. That's a great point. Oscar? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a great idea. I mean, I, I immediately thought of the success of like ESPN's 30 for 30s and E60s, of course, mm. all video. But it makes sense to, to move more into podcasting. We know that's the content of the future. It's eating into other type of media consumption time. And so it makes a total amount of sense. Also, it is related to tr trying to engage younger viewers i keep hearing this from all the leagues around the world i mean this is from soccer to you know nfl to a nhl as well it makes sense to target them with digital audio i think they should move into video games and twitch next so uh, i think it's a great play and a great deal for iheart media yeah, there were some numbers on that from our Emarks Briefing newsletter. Morning Consult, November 2020 research showing that 18 to 34-year-olds make up the lowest share of avid NFL fans, 26% of those 18 to 34-year-olds saying that, versus 36% of the age group just above 35 to 44. And the Mario Sotorreas, uh, insider intelligence analyst, was also pointing out that the NFL recently entered into uh, the most streaming-heavy set of rights deals it's ever signed, and it has been working to establish its presence across popular social networks like TikTok and Snapchat as well. So they're making moves. Story three, social media platforms are jumping on the nostalgia marketing trend that is set to dominate 2021, writes networking solutions platform Portada. Nostalgia marketing is exactly what it sounds like, uh, exactly what it says on the tin. The article explains, quote, when brands reintroduce images and themes from years gone by to sell their products and make us all think of the good old days, close quote. They note that social media companies have created numerous ways to facilitate our longing for times gone by, like Spotify's Wrapped that shows users the most listened to songs and artists from the past year, for, uh, their most listened to songs and artists from the past year, or Memories from Instagram and Facebook, a way to share throwbacks. Oscar, your thoughts on nostalgia marketing? I mean, first of all, I seen this Global Web Index study, I mean, as a nostalgic person, I, I was so happy to see that I am not alone. The results show that eight in 10 people said they experience feelings of nostalgia. It was great to see that. But, you know, it makes sense. I mean, we see it with everything. We see it with fashion, people adopting, you know, old fashion trends, accessories. We, sh we see it with movies, with remakes and reboots, with video games, the same mm -hmm. thing. So Mortal it Kombat, works. Yes, so good. Yes. So good. It works. It sells. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I hope. I love the Spotify wrapped content. So I really think all the socials should figure out how to, you know, kind of serve up old content to their users. Everyone loves it. 
Yeah. Yeah. That global web index research noting music, one of the biggest nostalgia triggers, I guess, expectantly. They also asked folks what they have felt uh, most nostalgic about over the past year. Music topped the charts for all age groups. So, uh, yeah. Um, that's all we've got time for for today's episode. I have dinner party data ready for the next one, man. Oh. No, just get ready. It's all right. We'll do it next time, but I'm ready. We'll do it now. No, no, it's going to be fine. Fine. We don't need to. <laughs> oh, we do need to. Wait, 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 wait. Slow things down. Oscar brought dinner party. <laughs> data i'm so sorry i'm kicking him out of my house and he's like i've got stuff to tell you I'm like, get out you've overstayed your welcome no no tell us what you got mate all right all right just so for what? people listening it's not we don't normally do dinner party data monday through thursday oscar had brought some because he wasn't sure i said he, he had some just in case and i was like of course bring it on it's always welcome course, so that's why that's why it's here go on it's the best part the best part so <laughs> it's the best part so yeah, it's true. let me ask you you gentlemen what's the most quintessential american meal when you guys think of like an american meal could be something that you, you know, we're talking about nostalgia, something that you think about often. Burger and fries. Burger and fries. Burger yes. Fries. Any, any other guess? It's not that. <laughs> uh, wings? No. Ribs? Let me just say it. Mac and cheese? Whoa, it's, whoa. Apple pie. Apple pie. Oh, exactly. Meal? Come on. Who's eating that as a meal? Oh. <laughs> you throw some cheese on there? You don't remember <laughs> as a kid? You know, that's, that's all you need, a good dessert. No, no, no. Uh, I'm, from across, I'm across the water. That's a, that's a disaster. Uh, so you sit down and have that as a full meal. Oh, absolutely. Like a dinner. A nice slice of cake or pie. Yeah, oh. That does it for me. <laughs> no, no, no. But I did want to say something. The next time you call something as American as apple pie, you might want to consider that apples don't come from America. Apples are actually, in fact, native to Asia. And the first recorded recipe for apple pie was actually written in, guess, this is a shout out to you, Marcus, in England. Oh no. In England. We so just remember that this. next time. <laughs> <laughs> so remember no. that next time. Oh, we started it. Yeah, of course. You guys I'm going started home, pretty I've, got to speak. I've got to go home. I've got to speak to some people. <laughs> So disappointed. <laughs> Who's having it as a meal? What a disaster. Anyway, we'll that's, what, that <laughs> that's what we got time for for today's episode. Thank you so much to my guests. Thank you to Peter. Thanks for having me. It's been great. Thank you to Oscar. Happy to be on. Uh, thank you to Victoria, who edits the show. Thank you to everyone listening. We'll see you guys tomorrow for the Behind the Numbers ad platform, the new marketer podcast made possible by Vtex, where Nicole Perrin, who hosts the show, she'll be speaking with Mike Menkes of Analytic Partners. You're a Bulls fan, Oscar. You're welcome nowhere <laughs> but Chicago. <laughs> We're terrible. Let's not talk about the Bulls. <laughs> You're welcome here, Oscar. You're welcome in this podcast.